Thank you. I'm Brian Helfand. I'm, apparently I was yelling from the corner over there, but apparently uh, chairing the session, so introducing myself. Um, I, I think ultimately the reason why that this uh, is particularly relevant to this group is that when we try to uh, understand where a lot of the patients, about a third of prostate cancer patients who enter the urology system, really present initially with LUTs, not because of their prostate cancer, but just run-of-the-mill BPH-associated uh, lower urinary tract symptoms, LUTs. So again, here are my disclosures. Um, but you know, what have we evolved and how has BPH management been changing over the past decade? And again, are there just too many meds? Everything we have, we, we throw a medication uh, out at. And unfortunately, when you look at BPH or the management of LUTs secondary to BPH, we know that we don't actually like taking medications, uh, whether it's because of side effects or because of uh, the lack of efficacy, but up to 70% of men are non-compliant with taking their BPH medications, even within that first year. So what are we really doing? And so again, um, then we just throw surgery at them. And, and again, the, the classic rotor rooter, uh, the TERP um, has been around uh, really since the, the start of uh, Egyptian times, to be honest, and uh, we're still uh, utilizing it. Uh, but more recently, there's been a plethora of uh, different uh, technologies that have been used to shave the adenoma, the inner part of that prostate, down to help uh, relieve that obstruction. Um, most recently, um, it was the Urolift, the prosthetic uh, urethral lift or clips that they're known of, that really kind of highlighted that there are differences between a lot of these uh, different modalities, but the importance of sexual function, and I'm not talking about erections here, but particularly maintaining your anterograde ejaculatory function is important to men. Even uh, if you ask men who are not sexually active, uh, up to 83% of men really want to preserve their sexual function uh, in, during the treatment of their urinary symptoms. So that really uh, has influenced most recently uh, a lot of the development of these uh, different technologies. But how are we facing this, uh, tech, you know, the challenge? Because again, we have an aging population that's increasingly uh, increasing in number. We don't have enough clinicians uh, to really meet all these needs. Um, how can we treat them effectively, provide that education? Do we answer as more drugs, which they may or may not take, um, or do we do more effective, cost-effective treatments, surgeries uh, to help relieve their obstruction? And again, we know uh, that, that uh, a list of technologies has uh, expanded, but a lot of these come at the expense of sexual function, which we again know are important to men. So is there that trade-off, and who's choosing? Is it the urologist that makes that choice? I only have one toolbox. I can do a rotor rooter, um, or should we be offering many different modalities to treat men's uh, BPH. And so, again, when you look at this, we know that TERP, the rotor rooter and shown in brown, has been on the uh, decline, although more recently it's been kind of back up. Uh, when we look at other things like Eurolift, that has been on the rise. Um, uh, water vapor thermo thermotherapy or resume has also been increasing, et cetera. But, you know, this is a, an ever cha uh, changing landscape and where are we going? So really the next part of this talk is really highlighting a lot of the newer developments that have uh, come forth in the past uh, several years in this uh, space. And so I was going to actually uh, talk a little bit about Optolume BPH, uh, which is a balloon system, uh, which is inflated in the prostate, causing an anterior co uh, commissurator uh, commissurotomy, um, and therefore kind of expanding that prostate channel. Um, it's actually going to be covered uh, in a later talk, so I'm not going to spend too much time other than to say it works. It works really well. Um, and certainly the double-blind study of this was recently published, highlighted by Steve Kaplan at the most recent Society of BPH meeting. Uh, it has a long-term effectiveness in this trial, which is a sham uh, versus a BPH Optolume uh, comparison. Um, everyone in that sham group actually thought that they actually uh, had the procedure, so it was a true trial. Um, and if you saw, there were significant improvements uh, compared to sham in that Optolume uh, trial as measured by BPH, as measured by PVR, QMAX, et cetera, that's been sustained uh, impressively uh, in one year. I think what's relevant to this group is also the reimbursement. Uh, so Steve Kaplan also recently highlighted the changes in Medicare. So again, uh, with most of these new technologies, uh, it is uh, paying quite well uh, in anywhere between between seven uh, to almost $9,000, whether you're doing it in ASC or uh, as an outpatient in the hospital. 
Um, and again, the results are really effective uh, over an 11 to 15 point improvement uh, in the IPSS and relief of that urinary symptom score uh, over that time. So again, you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, Want to highlight a change to the AUA got BPH guidelines in terms of uh, uh, prostate artery embolization. I'll, I'll say urologists here, uh, which have kind of glommed on, but also the interventional radiologists have been arguing uh, with the uh, guideline committee for years, um, adding uh, PAE to the actual inclusion criteria. Um, it has now been uh, put as level C grade uh, evidence for consideration of men uh, as an option for the treatment of BPH. And again, the only randomized trial that exists in this place, uh, in this space, which uh, has some uh, controversies around it, but did compare PAE to sham. Um, they looked at outcomes up to six months, and there was a crossover phase. Um, again, these are the typical studies, except that men uh, more than eight, uh, 45 years with uh, moderate to severe urinary symptoms were included. And then, as you can see here, is that there's a significant improvement uh, in that PAE group. And as soon as that sham was actually crossed over to the real uh, prostate artery embolization, significant and stained imp uh, improvement. Again, some caution should be had because there is some uh, skill differences based on the uh, proceduralist uh, doing this procedure and also based on the patient's prostate artery uh, anatomy, which may or may not be more amendable based on how many um, different arteries that are feeding uh, and, and branches off that uh, system. Aquablation uh, has also come into the market over the past uh, five to seven years. Again, this is considered a robotic surgery that takes advantage of simultaneous imaging with uh, ultrasound, where you can actually then uh, plan out the uh, and visualize the obstructing adenoma, then use a handpiece that's uh, inserted into the urethra. At the end of that handpiece, there's a water jet, which then follows the uh, program created and precisely just gets rid of the tissue that you told it to. Um, and again, and it's cool because in real time you can actually watch the obstructing adenoma uh, be relieved. I should also say because this is a prostate cancer meeting that aquablation is actually um, conducting trials currently to use it as a, a novel focal therapy for prostate cancer as well. Again, just based on the ability to uh, focally destroy uh, certain sp and areas of the prostate which you can see. And again, you can uh, specifically get rid of a median lobe, preserve a bladder neck, um, get rid of your lateral lobes, etc. The most unique part about aquablation is that you can actually see the very montanum and where the ejaculatory uh, ducts come in. So this is really touted as one of the few, if any, uh, truly resective procedures that preserve sexual function in up to 90% of the men. Um, again, if you look at the water study, this was the um, was study that uh, came for FDA approval that uh, directly compared aquablation to TERP. If you look, there was a significant improvement uh, that was comparable, if not better or superior to TERP, um, improvement in quality of life, uh, QMAX, uh, but the preservation of ejaculatory dis uh, or ejaculatory function uh, was 93%. I would usually quote patients at about 90% uh, preservation uh, of ejaculatory function. And again, you can now see that, uh, you know, kind of five-year data that that uh, durability uh, is still maintained in men up to um, uh, 60 years. And again, these are not small prostates. They range in size from 30 to 150 grams. Certainly, it has been done in larger prostates. States. Again, now we start moving into a different space as well. These are what are referred to as the true miss. Hey, we can do these in the office. Um, so ITIND uh, is a, a nitinol basket that was one of the first uh, brought to market and FDA approved. It is truly a basket uh, type structure that is temporary, so there's no permanent implantation of it. it uh, you put it in in the uh, prostate right at the bladder neck. It kind of hooks in there. It then expands and over a five-day period of time will actually incise that that bladder, neck, and prostate channel, uh, and then keep that open. And again, if you look at the year and soon to be five year data on this, that there is a significant, again, an improved and sustained um, uh, improvement in urinary symptoms as well as urinary flow over time. Um, again, there's lots of new players in this true mist uh, nitinol basket phase or craze, I should say. 
Uh, this includes Zenflow, Butterfly, Eurocross. E each day there seems to be a new basket uh, or, or nitinol device that's coming to market. The difference between these are these are you know kind of uh, permanent implantable. So we all are scarred because historically we use baskets and they became encrusted. Um, they were a nightmare to get out, etc. These baskets are actually uh, nitinol. They're non-reactive. They uh, stay in. They can stay in now. Uh, the studies have been for years. You can actually go and pull them out very easily at the end of the time. They actually do not get embedded into the tissue. One of those is Zenflow. This was the initial uh, study data um, from their Zest study. Um, again, these are implantable devices that uh, sit within that prostate. Uh, they stay in. And at the time, again, not unexpectedly, you see significant improvement. So where do we go? How do we decide? Is there something that can help us uh, a little bit more? Uh, certainly, Canada um, and the BPH uh, guys up there recently published their uh, decision uh, aid device where you can actually enter in uh, which procedures you have, whether it's, let's say, aquablation, Zenflow, et cetera, and uh, the patient can enter in what their uh, criteria and their goals are, and then that can make a easier option for you. AI has been entering in this space, so I think we have a lot uh, to come. But again, this is a very exciting uh, space because, again, it impacts a lot of the patients that we initially see that ultimately may have prostate cancer, um, so some of that may factor into this, but uh, something we should all be aware of. So thank you. Thank you.